Okay, so we're going to be looking at thoracic protocols, um, which are some of the most widely used protocols uh, that you will encounter. Uh, thoracic protocols is coupled with the abdomen and pelvic uh, protocols are going to be typically what you're going to be doing on a routine daily basis. Also, um, just routine he routine heads are going to be something that you do, but thoracic protocols are something that you have to familiarize yourself with. And so, um, if we just look at what CT, what kind of breakthrough CT has had, uh, we see that we had improvement in longitudinal resolution with conventional helical CT with its ability to acquire contiguous sections with overlapping reconstructions have proved to be a benefit in imaging through the body. So basically what this, what this is saying is that we have the ability to acquire a lot of images very rapidly and we don't have to have gaps in between the images. We can have them contiguous or uh, going up against each other. And so it's like a continuous scan. Uh, the most important advance in imaging technique, though, has come through the improved temporal resolution attributed to the ability to acquire data during a single breath hold. So that's something that you want to circle, uh, this single breath hold. Because a single breath hold results in decreased motion. Um, if if you haven't actually uh, taken the CT physics class, uh, that might be a little uh, strange to you that a single breath hold is going to decrease motion. But uh, just looking back at the old top scanners, like the first and second generation of CTs, um, there was a situation where a cable had to be unwound uh, to allow the tube to go back and start in position zero again and begin rotating around the patient. So the tube had to go back instead of circling around the patient at a continuous rate. And because of this, the patient had to breathe at some point in time. And so there would be in the middle of the scan a breath, uh, an expiration, and allow the patient to breathe normal. And then the patient would have to take a deep inspiration again and then you would begin the scan again. And because of this, many of the images wouldn't line up and there would be a significant amount of overlap or not overlap. Uh, and so uh, single breath hold has really improved things. Also, the single breath hold is due to shorter scan times, uh, which produce better images due to the amount of motion that accompanies thoracic structures. Okay, we know that the heart is always beating. There's nothing you can really do besides cardiac gating for it. And so there's always going to be motion in the thoracic cavity. However, uh, we can't eliminate patient respiration and things like that, uh, which we have voluntary control over. So that means that uh, shorter scan times help do this. Uh, variables that need to be considered for helical scanning include collimation, which is how tight uh, your boundaries are for your image. Uh, are you exposing the patient too much? Uh, pitch, as, as we saw, pitch. A greater pitch means that you're covering more area uh, than what is actually being scanned. And so basically, a greater pitch means that your dosage goes down, but your image noise goes up. Uh, Inversely, if you decrease the pitch, patient dosage goes up, and image quality really improves, and image noise goes down. Uh, breath hold period, we saw that before. You decrease the motion there. Field of view, how wide uh, is the area that you're actually reconstructing. Uh, reconstruction interval, uh, rate and volume of intravenous IV contrast administration. Uh, so that's going to play a big role. How fast are you injecting? And how much are you injecting? Uh, that will really play a huge role in what kind of scan that you actually get and what kind of images are required. Also, contrast uh, uh, top. Uh, we know that there are different types of contrast, and that can also play a role in what type of scan you actually acquire. Uh, reconstruction algorithm, and then radiation dose. Um, many things affect radiation dose, and so that's what we are striving to decrease in terms of computer tomography at the moment, is how can we get excellent scans without uh, yielding too much of a dose to patients. Uh, a lot of times, patients are not under 
they, they don't really have an understanding of what kind of doses they are. And so sometimes when you see uh, patients getting back to back to back scans, uh, it kind of raises a red flag in your mind because that's a lot of dosage. But many times the patients don't understand how much they're actually receiving. Okay, a resolution in general continues to benefit from thinner sections using a larger pitch when compared to thicker sections using a smaller pitch when covering the same anatomic volume. So uh, basically because we are using thinner sections, uh, we now have the ability to use a larger pitch. And you're going to see that in uh, many of our uh, protocols where the pitch is said to be something like 6 to 1. And so we're using a very large pitch. We're decreasing the dosage because we're covering more ground. So dosage is going down. And due to the fact that we're using thinner sections, we're actually keeping the resolution up. And so that's that's one of the amazing things with multi-slice CT, right? Uh, the amount of scan data is dramatically enlarged. Uh, there's no doubt about it. We are acquiring many more images, uh, so we see a lot of images here, uh, with significantly more potentially thinner images obtained at significantly faster rates compared with conventional single detector HCT or helical CT. And so uh, one of the m m many amazing things about computer tomography is the, the fact that we can acquire multiple thin images uh, at a very fast rate. And so uh, it's due to the amount of computing processors that we have and the type of structures that we have uh, that manufacturers have actually built for the scanners. Uh, great improvements. Also, uh, another thing to keep in mind, you probably want to start this, if the clinical indication of an examination is an abnormal radiograph, a survey examination with 5 to 7 millimeter thick sections is typically appropriate. Uh, so uh, if what you're looking for is just an abnormal radiograph, uh, kind of an, an ambiguous term, then 5 to 7 millimeter thick sections uh, are appropriate. However, uh, one thing that I would like to caution you on is that if you scan in 5 to 7 millimeter, you cannot go lower than 5 or 7 millimeter. Um, I'm sure uh, you may have saw some of the older uh, type images where there's this stair step pattern when you read construct like a coronal image and you have what looks to be levels going through anatomy something like this uh, that's due to using too thick of sections to reconstruct with and so I want to caution you that if you plan on doing any kind of reconstructions uh, five to sevens will not get the job done uh, so that's why we typically still even on abnormal radiographs we still acquire at uh, sometimes it's 0 0.75 to around 1.25 as being usually the area of uh, the slice thickness that we still acquire in and we can recon at five sevens we can go to 10 millimeter uh, we we can go crazy at like 15 millimeters if we wanted to thing is at 0 0.75 to 1.25 millimeters, we're still going to get adequate reconstruction uh, ability, and so it's going to look like a nice smooth image if you want to go with coronal or sagittal sections. Um, 5 to 7, just want to lock that. So we see that here. Uh, accepting that radiographic abnormality may represent small nodules. Uh, that's one of the downfalls of doing five to seven millimeter slices is that you may miss a very small nodule. If the nodule is smaller than five to seven, let's say it's a three millimeter nodule, you're actually going to miss that using your scan. Uh, so it's very important uh, that you can use 1.25 or one millimeter detectors or even smaller, and you can basically reconstruct them into a five or seven millimeter slice. 
but the important thing is not to miss anatomy. Uh, it's better to scan the patient using thin slices the first time than have to scan them again because you missed it uh, using thicker slices. So uh, that's the general rule of thumb. Use your use just your standard protocol, even though it says radiographic abnormality. Uh, use just your standard uh, chest protocol for it instead of modifying it to these thicker slices. Uh, reductions in artifacts related to cardiac motion and or arterial pulsation partly because of an increase in the table travel distance during each cardiac cycle, but more significantly through the capacity for prospective triggering of scan acquisition due to diastolic portion of the cardiac cycle or retrospective cardiac gating. Uh, so, um, because we have cardiac CT, uh, we want to decrease cardiac motion. So anytime that we can decrease this, uh, it's going to be a good thing. Uh, we know that we can't shut the heart down, but we can figure out when it's going to beat. And we scan using the diastolic portion. Uh, we know that that is the period of time where the heart is in relaxation. Uh, it's the best time to scan. And so we use this thing called cardiac gating, which uh, watches for uh, the heart to go into a relaxation phase when you hit a uh, T wave uh, for that brief moment where the heart is just relaxed and it attempts to scan at that phase and so you get the clearest images of the heart that you possibly can. So that is what cardiac gating is. So the big question is uh, when do we use IV contrast? Uh, Typically, for the thoracic cavity, it's used for a focused evaluation of vascular structures, uh, such as the aorta, pulmonary arteries, or abnormal parenchymal vasculature structures, such as vascular malformations. Uh, so, any type of abnormality, or looking at aorta, pulmonary arteries, um, things like that, anytime you're wanting to look for vascular structures, that's when you use IV contrast. Also, a differentiation of normal vascular mediastinal and hyalur structures from pathologic conditions. Okay, uh, so many times you cannot see an aortic dissection simply by looking at it without contrast. So that's why contrast plays a very important role because you're trying to demonstrate normal from abnormal. So it's very important there too. So uh, definitely no these two reasons here. Uh, also, it's essential to pay particular attention to the volume, rate, and concentration of administered contrast. A bolus as little as 60 milliliters of 300 milligrams per milliliter of contrast has been demonstrated as diagnostically adequate for imaging the thorax. And so, uh, basically, uh, it has been shown that 60 milliliters can get the job done. However, uh, we'll see that many times uh, your book uh, and all of these protocols are going to call for much higher rates of contrast uh, simply because they favor a different type of administration. So, uh, one of the most common exams that you can do in the thoracic cavity is for pulmonary embolism. Uh, in the years since its introduction has become accepted in most institutions as the initial examination in the evaluation of the patient suspected of having a PE. Uh, as we saw, many times patients uh, who are suspected of having uh, PEs have an elevated D dimer. So uh, that's uh, typically what you see as one of the greater indications for a pulmonary embolism. Uh, also, maybe labor breathing, things like that. Uh, studies report sensitivities from 53% to 100% and spe uh, specificities uh, from 78 to 100% for helical CT and diagnosing PE. Important thing to keep in mind here is that 53% and 78%. Uh, while we like for or like to think that CT is 100% accurate on everything, uh, there is this large area. You have to admit there's 47% in between 53% and 100%. And so because of that, 
uh, there is a lot of discrepancies on how accurate CT for pulmonary embolism actually is. Uh, when evaluation is limited to only central or segmental arteries, uh, sensitivity and specificity approach 90%. So when you only are looking at the main pulmonary arteries or uh, the segmental arteries that branch off the main, then uh, the diagnostic ability of CT rapidly increases. However, when you're looking out into uh, the very small portions of the pulmonary arteries that extend way out into the lungs, uh, sometimes it becomes kind of a guessing game whether there is an embolism there or not. And that's why 53% is a number that kind of hangs in the balance here. Uh, depends on the amount of contrast used, the type of contrast used, how well the bolus is, and it can also uh, depend on how it, how the patient's cardiac function is. And so all of these things hang in, uh, in the balance to affect how our exam is going to be. So it's very interesting. Uh, thin collimation is easily employed during a single breath hold examination ranging from 1.25 to 2.5 millimeter sections and reconstructed with overlap. So you want overlap on your images and uh, you want a range of 1.25 to 2.5 millimeter sections. Uh, I believe our facility we recon in 2 millimeter sections. Um, sometimes uh, I have seen uh, some studies get reconned at 2.5 uh, usually 1.25 uh, when you recon these uh, typically is going to be very uh, large in terms of images and so it becomes almost labor intensive just to even look at the images uh, based on the speed in which it's displayed. So, so usually 2 to 2.5 millimeter sections are usually a good reconstruction uh, area to be employed on this. Sometimes you can go up to three, but certainly not five to seven millimeters on this. And so uh, there are two types of approaches for pulmonary embolism. Uh, the first is a low concentration, high flow rate, which means that you basically use less contrast but faster. And so uh, you don't necessarily have to burden the patient with uh, things uh, like 85 to 100 milliliters of contrasted material. You just go with maybe 50 or 60, but you use a flow rate of around, uh, let's say the flow rate is going to be 5 to 6 milliliters per second which uh, necessarily doesn't seem like a very fast flow rate but when we see that most of our power injectors go up to six uh, you're maxing everything out and on top of that usually if you don't have a sufficient uh, intravenous access point uh, it's gonna be very detrimental uh, on how your exam is actually going to go if you have a poor uh, intravenous access then chances are you're going to have uh, infiltration and you're going to have to shut your exam down at some point in time due to just uh, extravasation of the IV site. Uh, so typically uh, this is not what you want to do. Uh, this is not really the right protocol. Some will favor this, uh, but a lot of books and a lot of uh, scholars favor this approach. A standard concentration but low flow rate. And when we say low flow rate, we're talking about three to four milliliters per second. Um, if you'll remember, uh, three milliliters per second, we found out that a 22 gauge intravenous access would support three milliliters per second. So this ultimately allows us to uh, utilize a, a more poor IV access site than uh, an excellent IV site and it kind of allows us to utilize this on all patients. Uh, we know that 
not all patients are going to have the ability to have great intravenous access. And because of that, we sometimes have to tailor our protocols to meet whatever they have. And so uh, the, the second one with the standard concentration low flow rate, uh, while it tends to give more contrast, and that's something to keep in mind, more contrast, but ultimately you ha have less danger of damaging the IV. Uh, but another thing to keep in mind here is uh, if you've got a patient who is, um, let's say, not in renal failure, but their renal function is decreasing, um, which one of these protocols is better? Because uh, low concentration would have a less type of uh, devastating effects to the kidneys, but you might take a risk on uh, not even being able to do the study, whereas standard concentration, you take a greater risk of damaging the kidneys, but you still maintain the intravenous access. It's it's something very, very important to think about because uh, really no one knows which side is right on this. So um, aortic dissections. Helical CT is established in most institutions as the initial diagnostic test for the assessment of the patient suspected of the aortic dissection. Catheter angiography, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, and transesophageal cardiography, or the TEE, is well recognized, highly accurate alternative means of establishing this diagnosis. But each has drawbacks, which have contributed to the ascendancy of HCT as the initial test in the setting. Uh, catheter angiography carries the attendant morbidity and mortality associated with invasive procedure may have limited availability in some institutions. So uh, the problem with angiography is that some institutions do not have this capability. Uh, rural community hospitals will not have this capability. And so uh, if you need to make a diagnosis very rapidly, this would be out because you'd have to transfer the patient to get them to have the ability to do this. Uh, patient motion. Uh, irregular respirations or poor ECG gating may degrade MRI quality and life support and monitoring devices if needed to eliminate MRI as an option for critically ill patients. So MRI can image critically ill and uh, you're going to have some patient motion and uh, not all respirations may be the same. So MRI doesn't really do an excellent job of demonstrating, demonstrating aortic dissections. Uh, transesophageal echocardiography, uh, in combination with transthoracic echocardiography, is highly accurate. So one one good thing about it is that it's very accurate in making this diagnosis and it diagnosis and has the advantage of a portable bedside examination. So the great thing is with uh, the TEE, uh, you don't have to come to it; it comes to you. However, the downfall is that. 24-hour uh, availability is not provided in many institutions. Uh, so in many institutions, just like uh, catheter angiography, you may not be able to get this done. So that's why computer tomography has really stepped in for this because um, pretty much every institution has a CT machine and has the capacity to image the aorta. Uh, specificity was 100% for helical CT. So we have we we're batting perfect here, uh, but 94% for TEE and MRI respectively. And so basically, we know that cardiac cath uh, has basically 100% uh, average as well. And so if we can rival what cardiac cath can do, then uh, we kind of take the pressure off of uh, the smaller facilities not having cardiac cath. Uh, the thing to notice is that there's a 6% chance for TEE and MRI to actually miss an aortic dissection. Uh, so we see that CT is, has really come into its own in terms of this. That's why you see so many studies of the aorta and the aortic and looking for aneurysms or dissections. Uh, parenchymal disease, uh, such as pulmonary nodules, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that it's accepted that optimal results require overlapping reconstructions of 20 to 30 percent. 
so you have to overlap your images uh, usually around this much and that is to decrease the chance of missing the pulmonary nodule um, and you cannot uh, afford to miss something uh, even though it may be a small nodule uh, because this can have devastating impacts for the patient so we, we strive to yield the best results that we can and that's caused by overlapping these images so I just keep this 20 to 30 percent in mind here trauma uh, that's another thing that we do a lot of in terms of CT um, the trauma patient is often the most acutely ill to present to the radiology suite we can all attest to that uh, initial imaging studies invariably include a portable chest radiograph which even with optimal technique is a challenging examination to interpret uh, so many times we don't have optimal conditions. Uh, many times in the trauma situation, you're rushed, and so uh, a lot of times it's get what you can get, and get it on uh, the screen so that the physician can see what they're working with. Uh, so many times, optimal technique it kind of goes out the window uh, for speed. Uh, in the setting of trauma, a rapid and accurate diagnosis is critical. And the examination technique is limited due to the patient position. Uh, so basically, uh, we also know that if the patient is uh, male positioned, it is very, very difficult to actually get a good image. Uh, you just have to work with what you have. Uh, also, you have the possibility of overlying instruments, uh, clothing, and occasionally body habitus. Uh, that's another thing about uh, portable techniques. We can only uh, account for so much, and there's going to be a time to where even your uh, grid that you've placed on your cassette is not going to get the job done in comparison to what a normal conventional radiograph in your room would do uh, if you're shooting it uh, in the emergency room where the trauma situation is using portable. Uh, so that brings in multi slicer helical CT which allows rapid and comprehensive screening of the thorax including evaluation of the mediastinum, aorta, lungs, bronchi, diaphragm, esophagus, spine, and other osseous structures. So basically, uh, multi slice CT allows us to image all of the thorax uh, very rapidly and there's not going to be any problems there. Uh, there's not much that you can do to get it wrong uh, and CT offers so much manipulation that you're going to be able to really see things um, we saw certain situations where we've had trauma and uh, I've shot a portable chest and they were looking for uh, rib fractures and you really you thought that maybe there were some rib fractures but you really couldn't see it in terms of uh, just your portable technique so uh, we put them on the table for CT and scan them quickly um, they're in and out of the suite in uh, five to six minutes while the images are reconstructing themselves and then we can eliminate everything and pull out the bones and allow the physicians to actually see if there's rib fractures or not. Uh, so uh, multi-slice CT has really changed the way the trauma situations are handled. I'm sure that we all can attest to that. Uh, detailed evaluation of the, of the mediastinum also allows identification of mediastinal air if present and defines its relationship to the airways which may aid in localizing the site of a bronchial rupture and so if you had trauma that's called a bronch uh, that has caused a bronchial rupture CT can help uh, demonstrate that uh, also we have NPRs or multiplanar reconstructions are used in this regard and are extremely useful for evaluation of the diaphragm and possible rupture uh, this is often a misdiagnosis, in part because the diaphragm is generally in the plane of section on axial views, and detection of tears or disruptions are hence difficult to detect. So now we have the ability to not only image axial, but we have coronal and sagittal images as well. So we can pretty much manipulate the images to aid in diagnosis uh, for whatever the physician may be looking at. Uh, herniation of abdominal structures above the diaphragm is more easily appreciated with NPR images as well. So disruptions in the diaphragm and herniations uh, really are demonstrated with other images besides just the axials for this. 
So that brings us to lung cancer screenings. Uh, the role of CT in screening for the detection of early lung cancer has emerged as one of the most controversial issues in radiology today. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related death in both men and women in the United States. And we know that the survival statistics are very dismal. Uh, the overall cure rate remains at around only 12% with a five-year survival rate of 15%, which means that uh, if you are so fortunate to hit the five-year survival rate, um, you're going to be one of uh, very few that actually have that ability to do that. Um, uh, to a degree, this is thought to partially reflect the advantage st advanced stage of many lung cancers at presentation. And so what this is saying here is that uh, many times when you actually find uh, a malignant lung mass, it's already too late because it's in advanced staging when you actually find it. And so that's what CT has attempted to remedy. And so um, we, we typically think of CT, once again, as being excellent at doing everything. Uh, and so that's why so many times uh, you see an abnormal chest radiograph or something like that. Uh, or you're looking for a nodule and you order CT. However, the limitation of the sensitivity of low dose CT and the detection of nodules uh, was emphasized by a study of Cananuma. Um, in this report of 1,443 smokers, a uh, study with a total of 5,418 baseline follow up CT scans. Seven of 22 lung cancers were only identified retrospectively, ranging in size from 4 to 13 millimeters. So basically what retrospectively indicates is that uh, after a diagnosis was made of lung cancer or the disease progressed, then they were had the ability to go back and look at the scans and say, well, I guess that was uh, the area that actually uh, bloomed out into uh, this huge mediastinal mass uh, in, in the patient. And so based on this data, uh, these, authors, these authors concluded that the minimum threshold for accurate identification of nodules was between 7 and 9 millimeters in size. And so uh, you each need to keep this in mind, put a star by it. Uh, what these authors really decided or came upon uh, was that you can only see a nodule that's in, that some were seven to nine millimeters in size. You can't really see anything smaller than that. Uh, similarly, uh, in the LCAP study, uh, when a conventional dose diagnostic helical CT was later obtained to characterize nodules detected at screening in 188 cases, a total of 31 individuals, or 16%, proved to have additional nodules. Uh, these were missed on the initial scan, but could be retrospectively identified. Um, the scary thing is this word retrospectively. Uh, we don't strive to be able to go back and look and see where we missed things, but we rather want to be able to see things in real time and make di accurate diagnosis. Uh, of equal significance is the problem of specificity and false positive examinations. In the study of Kenfio, uh, only 19 or 8.3% of 228 lesions assessed by HRCT uh, proved to be malignant. And so uh, that's one of the things that people often, often have a misnomer about is that CT can tell you that something is there, but you cannot just determine from CT if something is malignant or benign. We do not have that capability or capacity. Uh, so basically that's why we see that only 19% of all of these 228 lesions actually proved to be malignant. And I assume that that was after biopsies. Uh, so there is a huge false positive uh, portion of examinations that we have in terms of CT. Uh, more recently in the LCAP a prevalence study, 233 nodules were detected in 23% of individuals screened, but only 2.7 proved to 
be malignant. So based on preliminary data from a number of studies presently underway, it's likely that the prevalence of non-malignant nodules among asymptomatic screened individuals may be as high as 50%. So uh, based on the data, 50% of people that are walking around uh, may actually have nodules, but uh, only 2.7% of these uh, individuals may actually be malignant. Uh, but you can think of uh, knowing that you have a nodule inside your lungs and how frightened that would be. And so that, that really strikes terror into a lot of patients simply because they hear that they have something uh, and whether it's malignant or not for the time being until the diagnosis is made, it really doesn't matter because you assume the worst. And so um, that's one of the things that CT has to continue to work on. Um, we, we typically uh, enhance the type of software that comes with CT. We have lung nodule assessments, uh, things like that, to where we can monitor whether a nodule is growing or staying the same. If it's staying the same, we can isolate it and see and take measurements and the densities and all of this. But still, we do not have the capability to determine whether something is malignant or benign. And that, that's what really is scary for most people. Okay, so now what we're going to look at is basically um, your PDF file that's attached uh, on Blackboard. And this is what we're going to look at for your protocols. Uh, if you notice, this is a routine chest. So just a standard chest without contrast, or even a chest with contrast. And so what we're doing this for is a mediastinal and axillary adenopathy, a mediastinal tumor, or staging. And so uh, just basically these are some things that can cause this. Uh, but also we can pencil in um, potentially an abnormal chest x-ray, things like that can also be an indication for a routine chest. So as we know, uh, the patient is going to be positioned supine uh, with their arms above their head. And uh, that's going to be the same for pretty much every one of these scans. Uh, the arms being above the head uh, helps to reduce artifacts. Uh, if you've ever scanned um, someone who does have their arms by their side, uh, as you're going into uh, the lower portion of the chest, there tends to be uh, a lot more artifact evidence in it, uh, sometimes running artifact all the way across the image. And so that's why we seek to eliminate it by having the patient raise their arms above their head. So the anatomical range, um, or the topogram, uh, some, sometimes scanners will call it a scanogram. Uh, I've also heard serve All of these are the same thing. Uh, it's what it's the image that you use to plan everything out, and that would be this and this. Uh, uh, many times you only get this view. Uh, other times, some scanners and their protocols will be set up to obtain a sagittal view or a lateral view as well. Uh, but in terms of this, we're looking for lung apices to below the diaphragm, and so uh, if we see here. We have the lung apices being somewhere around here, as this is the first rib. And so we're looking somewhere here. So we're slightly above. And then there is the diaphragm. And so we're below that. And so if we'll notice here, here's the diaphragm. And somewhere around here is the apices. And so we have got all of this area covered and we are getting the lungs in full. Also, um, there are instructions for obtaining the scan. Uh, the patient needs to hold their breath at inspiration and usually the scan won't take very long. If by some chance a routine chest you need to have contrast enhancement, we're going to look for injecting around 100 milliliters at 3 milliliters per second. Uh, Depending on your hospital and, and what the protocols are there, uh, this 100 milliliters may be adjusted to smaller numbers. Uh, at our facility, we actually use 
75 millimeters, uh, milliliters. Uh, that is what we use. Uh, and this is uh, basically Isoview 300 is what we use. Uh, and our protocol is at 3 milliliters per second. Uh, the image timing that it's going to take um, after the initial part of the injection or the initial start of the injection is 30 seconds. That's usually the go time uh, to obtain good contrast enhancement. Uh, the collimation is 64 by 0.6 or that's what you're going to acquire these images at is 0.6 millimeter slices uh, but notice that this is uh, pretty much subject to whatever scanner you're actually scanning on and so uh, sometimes this may be uh, a little different. Pitch uh, in your book, it says pitch of one, but I also have some protocols from other uh, scanning scanning machines uh, and other uh, scanners uh, that we'll go over, and we'll see things like pitch six to one or pitch four to six. And so, uh, necessarily, what this is saying is that. Uh, you're covering the same amount as the table is traveling. There's no overlap or anything. And so what this seeks to do is provide you with uh, excellent resolution and dosage. Also, uh, we have to notice that there are comments here. Uh, number one is uh, we need to view soft tissues and lung windows. Uh, so you need to not only worry about mediastinum, but there could be adenopathy somewhere else besides in the lung field. Uh, if only lung nodules or inflammation of interest, uh, then low dose protocol, protocol is ideal. And so uh, you can use a low dose protocol here, which would typically be uh, increasing pitch. And also, uh, NPRs may be helpful. So, uh, definitely look at NPRs because they will prove to be invaluable in situations like this. Okay, that brings us to lung nodules. Uh, if we're just wanting to see whether there is a nodule or not, uh, typically, uh, this is what we're going to be, just to evaluate whether there is or not. So, if you want to write beside this, this will be for evaluation. Uh, as our previous, uh, patient is going to be positioned supine, arms above the head. Uh, so where we're scanning from is the lung apices, which once again, here and here, uh, to the bottom of the diaphragms or below. Uh, typically I like to scan uh, usually to the adrenal glands on this, so uh, you can substitute diaphragm for uh, adrenal. Here. Um, so that that will work in this case as well. Once again, the patient is going to be instructed to hold their breath upon inspiration, as the scan will not last uh, a great deal of time. I notice that there is no contrast enhancement here, and so basically, um, we're just doing this to evaluate whether there is a presence of anything in it. Uh, other studies will be done, uh, as we'll see, like a focal enhancement study to really demonstrate whether there is uh, a nodule or not. And because there is no contrast injected, there is no need for time to do. So as soon as you uh, plan to scan out, you can go ahead and scan. Uh, notice once again we're at 0.6 by 64 slices. Uh, another thing that I want to tell you on uh, 
the topogram or your server view planning everything out is uh, you definitely want to not collimate in so close. I notice that we have uh, some air here and here. Uh, you want to definitely be able to get all the soft tissue structures here and uh, even as you're going down to the abdomen. Uh, simply because if there is some type of pathology there, you don't want to miss it or calm it half of it off. So uh, once again, our pitch is going to be 1, uh, and that is to uh, optimize the scan. Uh, but sometimes uh, pitches don't necessarily come out to be 1 uh, for multi-slice CT. And notice that uh, this book is talking about 64 slice machines. And so your protocols are going to be modified based on the amount of detectors that you have. So uh, all of this kind of varies somewhat. Um, but overall, even with uh, smaller slice machines such as the 16 slice, uh, the patient breath hold is still going to be very brief. And so the patient shouldn't necessarily be able to hold this. Uh, and also, there is no contrast agent required for this since it is just a type of planning exam. Okay, this is uh, a combination thorax. Uh, we look at the indications. Um, Basically, this is an examination of the lungs and mediastinum. So we're looking at mediastinal structures uh, as well as lungs. Uh, the position and the anatomic range or where you're going to be scanning from is all the same. Uh, so this is going to be the same as previous. Okay. So as we go on down, uh, Breath hold is going to be pretty much the same as well at the inspiration. Uh, on this scan, we are doing contrast enhancement, and this is going to be at 3 milliliters per second, and we're going to be injecting around uh, 100 milliliters. And so, uh, if we look at basically, uh, we're going to be taking uh, Quite a while to inject this contrast, uh, and so this is why our image timing is going to be at 40 seconds. Uh, if you notice, it's a little different than the routine chest, and this is so that we can better demonstrate uh, the mediastinal structures. Uh, collimation is still going to be the same. Notice that this is for a 64 slice machine still, and so potentially your collimation may be different. Uh, not all machines will go down to 0.6. Some stop at 0 0.75 millimeters. Uh, so whatever your machine goes down to, that would be uh, typically where you're looking at scan. Uh, pitch, yet again, is 1. But the comments that we need to take into account are uh, soft tissue and lung windows presentation for lung and medius time. So we need uh, both soft tissue and lung windows to present uh, an accurate uh, scan. Uh, breath hold, once again, is very brief, and so uh, that's going to make this uh, pretty adequate for most patients. Uh, interesting thing is oral barium solution may be given to improve demonstration of esophagus where desirable. Uh, however, this runs the risk of uh, the patient almost aspirating, so you have to make sure they don't have any problems swallowing. Uh, the risk of aspiration uh, sometimes outweighs uh, the benefits here. So aspiration is a big thing, and we don't want it. Um, MPRs uh, and MIPs, or maximum intensity projections, are really useful for this. And so uh, you typically want to provide the best uh, diagnostic quality available, and that's what MPRs really help seek to do. Uh, so make sure that you utilize MPRs here. Okay, so that brings us to high resolution CT lungs. Uh, and why it's called high resolution is that they are reconstructed at a smaller interval. 
and to maximize uh, spatial resolution. Uh, so you want your resolution to be as good as it can be. So you want an increase in resolution. Um, the reason for this is because you're looking for small things like interstitial lung disease, uh, bronchiectasis, and even opportunistic infections. And so because of this, uh, you typically are looking for small pathologies and you need the highest resolution that you can to delineate between certain types of pathology. Once again, the patient is going to be supine with arms above their head. You're going to be scanning from the lung APCs to below the diaphragm. And remember I said that uh, below the diaphragm can also mean uh, to the adrenal glands. It's normally whatever your facility's protocol is uh, and what the radiologist likes. Uh, the patient is going to be holding their breath at inspiration. There is no contrast enhancement, and meaning that there is no timing either. Uh, we're going to be scanning at the small slices available, and basically, uh, we come down to the comments. And notice that our, our breathing instructions said uh, to see the comments. And so uh, we see that expiration sequence, if required, may be, uh, of course, more limited. And so basically, a uh, person blows all their breath out and doesn't breathe again. Sometimes this is required, uh, but most of the time, uh, just a simple breath hold inspiration is sufficient. Also, we see that uh, prone sequence, if required, may be more limited as well, may be more difficult for the patient to lay on their stomach uh, and accomplish these scans. And so basically, uh, what you're going to do is uh, your scan is going to be acquired at this. But that doesn't mean that you're going to recon it in 0.6 millimeter scan, uh, or slices. Uh, what you're probably going to recon it in is 2 millimeter uh, and using lung windows. Uh, to maximize the ability to see inside of the lungs and to really demonstrate what these small pathologies really look like. And so uh, typically this is going to be the most efficient way for high resolution CT. Uh, and uh, really there is no differentiation between the way that we acquire this scan uh, other than the fact that we're just going to recon it a little differently. And that's something that the book uh, that we have for you all uh, really doesn't uh, go into a great deal of detail about why this is necessary and everything. But uh, when we say high resolution, that just means we're maximizing the resolution uh, by using thinner slices when we recon it and using certain algorithms uh, to give us the, the best resolution that we can. And so you might see images that have like a sharp detail. Uh, algorithm on it or uh, typically you won't see uh, a smooth algorithm uh, in terms of this and so uh, typically you're going to want sharp detail and that's what you're going to see uh, really bore out in high resolution CT. Uh, probably most of the time we're doing high resolution CT and we don't even realize that that's what we're doing. Uh, simply because we're using it under the, the misnomer of just a routine chest without contrast. And our protocols are already situated to provide the best resolution that we can get. Okay, uh, now we have a coronary artery disease or coronary artery calcification screen. And so, uh, as the name implies, uh, this is for possible coronary artery disease. Uh, and what we're looking for is, as the name implies, calcifications. Uh, another possible indication is atypical chest pain, um, meaning that the, the patient is having some abnormal type of chest pain uh, and 
no one really knows where it's coming from, and so uh, you want to check the coronary arteries out as best as possible. Uh, patient position is still the same. The anatomical region, that is where we're going to see a great deal of difference. Notice it's at the bifurcation of the trachea or the forelimum. Uh, to the diaphragm. And so you see the diaphragm here and here. Uh, but where we're looking what we're looking for is the bifurcation of the trachea. So we see the trachea coming down. And then we see it do this. And this is where we're wanting to scan from is the bifurcation. Uh, so somewhere in this general vicinity here is where we're wanting to actually begin, uh, down to the bottom of the diaphragms or a little farther than that. And so uh, you typically on your lateral image it's going to be kind of worthless because you really can't see. Uh, we see something here, uh, but it's really difficult to make out what we're actually looking at. So uh, you're typically going to utilize your AP image. And so uh, the patient is going to be instructed to hold their breath at inspiration. And notice we don't worry about contrast enhancement because we're looking for calcifications. Uh, one of the biggest enemies of uh, demonstrating calcifications is contrast. And so you don't want to use that. Uh, image timing, there is no image timing on it. Uh, it's still going to be the same collimation. Pitch is still the same. And Number one is what we're really looking for. Uh, as we talk about uh, electrocardiography, uh, gating or ECG gating or EKG gating is going to be uh, waiting for the T wave to actually come about on the EKG so that the patient can be scanned while the heart is in relaxation. And so that's what you're going to need. You're going to absolutely have to have this to actually uh, do calcium scoring uh, or a coronary calcifications and uh, also you're going to have to have automated scoring software and it needs supervision and so uh, there's a lot of things that go into actually acquiring this exam your machine has to be set up to actually even allow you to do this because you can't just take a patient in and hope that you can see some type of calcification because it's never going to work. So basically there's a lot of things that have to factor in before you can accomplish this exam and it's definitely important for us to remember the comments here on this. Um, but in, in the grand scheme of things the only thing that is really different between this and uh, the previous things that we've looked at is where you're going to start the scan. Um, notice that we'll have a full topogram or serve you uh, because you don't really know where the bifurcation is and so you really can guess. You want to get all of the lung field so that you can best demonstrate where the bifurcation of the trachea is. But once you know where the bifurcation is, uh, then you can scan down and acquire your images. Okay, uh, from here on out, these are actually not in your book, and uh, uh, anything that you need to know about these will be on this uh, PDF file. And so this is what we call a thoracic survey, and it's for detection or staging of thoracic neoplasms, adenopathy, complex pulmonary pleural disease. And so uh kind of has a long list of things. Uh, scanner settings, you normally, normally run KD around 140, and your MA is going to be 120. Uh, oral contrast, we're looking at the thoracic cavity, so there is no oral contrast uh, for this skin. Phase of respiration, it's going to be patient holding your breath at inspiration. So once again, uh, the commonality here is that it's at inspiration. Uh, the acquisition slice thickness, notice that this varies from what we actually uh, had from the other 
uh, images or the other protocols from the book, uh, in that you're requiring it one to two point five more meters uh, to be combined with the abdomen. And another thing that's really different is the pitch. Uh, they go by a different measurement of pitch, and they say that it's going to usually be around four to six, uh, with high speed being six to one. And what this means is that the table is moving faster than skin. So that's one way of looking at it, uh, that your cable is moving the patient at a faster rate than what your coverage is with scanning. And so you're not scanning as much as what the cable is moving. And so the patient dosage uh, has actually went down. And that is why it's called high speed. Uh, reconstruction slice thickness interval for filming is 5 to 7 millimeters. And so you're looking at five to seven millimeter slices. And so uh, typically that's, uh, you usually favor fives, not sevens. Um, and so your scanning area is going to be from the superior margins of the clavicle, which is above the lung apices. So uh, somewhere around here. But we typically go, as long as you've got the lung apices in here, then you're good to go. And two adrenal glands, uh, that's where I typically scan to is adrenal glands. Uh, but notice your other book said scan to the base of the diaphragms. And so uh, I typically like the adrenal glands. Uh, but in this case, either situation would work. Uh, once again, I just want to reiterate that uh, a lot of times protocols are really not set in stone, but they're more or less based on what your facility says. And so while books can uh, typically try and point you in the right direction, uh, there are all kinds of modifications based on what radiologists like and how far they want you to scan and what you're looking for. Uh, but you can say, you can interchange uh, adrenal glands with the diaphragm. So uh, either one will actually work good. So if, if we're going to use IV contrast, we're looking at uh, LOCM type of contrast, uh, not HOCM. And so this decreases the amount of reactions that are possible uh, at 2 milliliters per second. And so notice that we're not going crazy with uh, the injection, but also we have increased our scan time. Uh, or when we're going to scan after the initial phase of injection, 45 seconds. Uh, uh, this book tends to go a little higher on the volume. Uh, we have 100 to 125 milliliters. Uh, but typically, uh, our facility will use 75 to 85 milliliters. Uh, and it has proved to be sufficient. I remember other studies have demonstrated that as little as 60 milliliters. Uh, Injected contrast can prove to be effective. So once again, this is based on uh, what your facilities really uh, lines out, and also uh, patients, uh, what type of patient you have, and what the renal function is. So a lot of this is uh, driven by what physicians believe uh, will be the most adequate for patients. But if we look at the contrast, we see a one uh, or the comments. We see that. 1 or 2.5 millimeter thick high resolution images can be reconstructed for focal lesion or lung regions as needed. So uh, remember we said that we were reconstructing in 5 to 7 millimeter slices, but if you were to see some focal lesion, you can actually thin your slices down uh, through this area. You can recon the full image and then go back and recon smaller images through that because you have actually acquired them at uh, 1 to 2.5 millimeters. But also keep in mind that if you acquire the images at 2.5 millimeters, you cannot go lower than 2.5. 2.5 is your baseline. Also, if the study is part of a chest abdomen pelvis examination, 
Uh, the 2.5 millimeter call motion array should be used on the volume zoom scanner, but we're not going to worry about this at all, so don't really worry about number two. And also, uh, if the radiation exposure is a concern, and many times it is because we not only uh, scan middle aged to it, elderly patients, but we also scan young patients as well. And it's essential that we actually decrease the doses down for the young patients. And so uh, this examination may be obtained with a low dose technique using 40 to 80 MA. So that's something to keep in mind on your young patients. Uh, 80 MA will be grossly sufficient uh, to provide adequate imaging for your young patient. So definitely keep uh, this in mind. Next is pulmonary embolism. Uh, as we all know, this is a scan that you will frequently do and uh, become very adept, I guess would be uh, the right terminology for this at doing. Um, once you find something that works, uh, you usually will be able to carry that through most all the patients. Uh, and uh, that's just the key, finding what works best to yield the best images that you can. And once you get it, then continue doing it and just repeating your steps. Uh, a lot of this is just repetition. Uh, we see that the reason that we do a key study is to for suspicion of acute chronic thromboembolism. Uh, disease. So basically, you're looking for embolism. Um, scanner settings once again KB is going to be 140, MA is going to be 120. No oral contrast. Uh, going to shoot at inspiration. And we're going to scan around 1 to 2.5 millimeters. Uh, pitch, once again, this book says 4 to 6. And if we are super concerned with scanning very rapidly, uh, it can be 6 to 1. Uh, and I know the 6 to 1 and 4 to 6, it may be kind of throwing a lot of people off. Because uh, we saw in the other book that it said pitch of 1. But um, basically, studies have demonstrated uh, that there is not enough uh, resolution fall off. At six to one versus basically a one to one. So uh, six to one is just as effective, but gets the skin down at even quicker. And so uh, you're not trading off much resolution for getting the patient in and out very quick. And so uh, many times uh, the high speed approach is very viable. Uh, reconstruction, slice thickness. We see that that's different than what we saw before. Uh, this is at one to two millimeter, um, and for lung, uh, you have to have every other image, and for the mediastinum, you have each image. And so, uh, basically, uh, you want to go around two millimeter uh, to two point five. I saw both 2 and 2.5 millimeter slices. Uh, and so basically, uh, you're utilizing, if you're using uh, 1 millimeter slices, but you're reconning them to 2.5 or 2, uh, then you use each image that you acquire, or each image that is reconstructed. Uh, you don't change any of them. Uh, the scanning area is the entire thorax. Uh, from the superior margins of the clavicles to the upper abdomen. And so th I realize that this is slightly ambiguous, but you have uh, the diaphragm here once again, uh, which would be considered the near medium to the abdominal cavity, uh, but uh, typically scan down to the adrenals. That is most efficient. The adrenals would be located around T11 to T12, or possibly even L1. And so you're looking in this area. Uh, and you see that we're probably looking at uh, this being uh, 
probably L1 or T12. And so um, if this is actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we're probably looking at L1 here. And because of that, uh, we're actually uh, probably right around here would be sufficient for the adrenal glands. Uh, but you never know, so uh, it never hurts to scan just slightly lower just to make sure that you actually get uh, everything that you can. Uh, we're also going to use LOCM uh, type of contrast, not HOCM once again, uh, so that we decrease the risk of reactions. Uh, this pretty much goes without saying because uh, when you actually draw your contrast up or it arrives in um, the syringes for you to load on the injector uh, pretty much it's going to be LOC in contrast. Uh, notice that we have increased uh, the rate of injection to 3.4 uh, uh, 3 to 4 milliliters per second but interestingly enough uh, this is if you have a large gauge IV. Uh, so if you have uh, uh, 18 or 20 this would be no problem but problem really in lies is what do you do when you don't have an 18 or a 20. I've actually had to do P studies uh, with patients who have had 24s before and uh, the the real trick is utilizing your bolus tracking software. If you can utilize it and learn the in and outs of it then you can optimize your study for it. We have a threshold on ours uh, that you have to achieve before you can actually scan. And our threshold is usually set at 120, uh, but I modify the threshold and bump it up to 135 uh, to 140. And so that it means that it has to get a little more density before it will actually allow it to scan. And because of this, uh, I can utilize the smaller IV to my advantage. And many times I inject at two or even two and a half um, uh, using well actually a two uh, for 22s uh, because I don't want to push the IVs because it's better to actually um, modify your settings to achieve the study than to push the IV and have it infiltrate while uh, the scan is going on and so you've injected all of this and you're unsure about the volume that you've actually delivered to the patient and what is actually uh, infiltrated and so uh, this helps to remove that variable. Uh, also the book says uh, to use 150 but I kind of think 150 is overkill. We use IsoView 370. Uh, we've talked about using 300 uh, milligrams per milliliter uh, and uh, 370 would be 370 milligrams per milliliter. It means that it's a slightly uh, more dense contrast material and so we typically use 85 uh, milliliters. Uh, once again, this is based on typically whatever your facility uses. Uh, typically, you go along with whatever protocol it is because that it, there is a reason for that protocol. Uh, but uh, each facility is different. Uh, your scan delay is going to be used by the BOLUS software, and uh, it can be around a 10 to 15 second delay. Um, after you start the initial injection, but uh, many times it will be even longer than that. It might be a 25 second delay. Uh, 25 second delay uh, so that you get the most contrast that you can invading the pulmonary arteries so that you can better demonstrate uh, a pulmonary embolism. So once again, uh, check your BOLA software out and uh, see what modifications you can make and then once again uh, you're not going to be perfect on um, pulmonary embolism studies. Uh, no one really is. Even the most seasoned techs uh, still have studies where they just don't come out as well as possible. Uh, once again remember that um, it's very hard even using BOLUS tracking software to get uh, the best quality images that you can. 
uh, because every patient is different and cardiac function will play an essential role in what the patient will actually yield. So everything is kind of up in the air on this study and um, it's very hard to actually get an adequate study to where you see all of the sub subsegmental arteries and uh, you don't miss anything. Very difficult to get. So that brings us to pelvis or leg venography. Uh, and many times uh, this is used in conjunction with pulmonary embolism studies. Uh, so uh, you might want to put it here with the study. And so uh, typically if you're if you have an elevated D dimer, once again that just measures that there is a potential presence of a degrading clot in the bloodstream. And so uh, that doesn't necessarily signal that it is in the pulmonary arteries. You just want to rule that out. And so uh, you want to also have the ability to look at pelvis or legs to see if uh, there is any potential DVT there as well. Uh, if the patient does have a history of blood clots in the legs, many times this study will be surpassed by using just an ultrasound. Uh, as being much more effective, uh, but if you've already done a PE study uh, or you're doing a PE study, then uh, this doesn't require any more contrast or anything like that. So you can typically just modify your your scan settings and continue on with the study. I notice we have uh, KVP being 120, so we've lowered the KVP down from 140 to 120, but we've also increased the mass from uh, 120 to 240, so we've really increased the mass. Uh, once again, no oral contrast, and we don't even have to worry about respiration on this. Uh, the patient has held their breath for the PE study, and now we can go down to where really the, the breathing is not going to make much of a difference. Uh, acquisition, slice thickness, this is where we really need to pay attention. We have 5 millimeter to 7 millimeter, which very well corresponds to uh, what we're going to reconstruct them in at five to seven and a half millimeter. The reason that we scan five to seven is because uh, the amount of material that we're actually covering is going to generate a lot of scan data, and so we decrease the amount of scan data by using thicker slices. But also, this uh, increases uh, the throughput time so that we don't have to wait around for these images to reconstruct. Here it is now uh, when we use basically what we require. Uh, the pitch is going to be variable. Uh, we really are not given what type of pitch is going to be, but we do know for high speed it's going to be six to one. Uh, the scanning area is really what we're looking out for, uh, and it's going to be from the iliac crest to the tibial plateau. And so uh, this image I realize is kind of hard to demonstrate, but around here is the iliac crest. And so we're slightly above the iliac crest, and here's going to be the tibial plateau, and we're slightly below it. And so uh, we've actually got all of this area covered. We've got enough uh, area on both sides so that we're actually uh, getting rid, uh, or we're getting rid of the possibility of leaving something out. Uh, notice that the patient's arms. Are by their side, uh, so necessarily this scanogram is not uh, utilized for this study. And if we actually go down, we see that there is a fracture of uh, tibia and fibula there, um, and that's really what they're doing in the scan pool, probably a trauma survey. But in terms of this image, uh, this would be what we're actually looking for. Uh, also, there is the IV contrast that we use if we were just simply doing this and not. Uh, in conjunction with the study is uh, the LOCM. We don't really have a flow rate on this image. And so uh, basically we also need to keep this in mind that there is no additional contrast uh, used 
when performed with a PE study. So if you are utilizing a PE study, uh, then you don't need to inject any, any more contrast. So what you've injected is sufficient. The only thing that you have to worry about is scanning two minutes after the initial injection. So after two minutes rolls around, then that would be the optimal time to actually scan. Uh, remember that DBT it, uh, implies deep vein thrombosis. And so if you're looking for the venous return, it's going to take two minutes for it to happen, uh, for it to start working its way back from the legs. And so just keep that in mind, you have two minutes for that. Okay, um, many times we're looking for thoracic aorta. Uh, you'll have uh, protocols or patients that need a protocol for maybe an aortic dissection. Uh, aortic aneurysm assessment, we see those quite often where patients uh, have been told that they have a triple eight and they're wanting it assessed. Uh, also, a penetrating atheromatosis ulcer. But typically, this is what you're going to see, either for an aortic dissection or an aortic aneurysm. Uh, KDP is going to be 140, MA is going to be 120. It's going to be the same, uh, pretty much setup that we saw before. No oral contrast. Patient needs to suspend respiration upon inspiration. If we're looking for a chest and we're only doing the chest, then we typically Require these slices at least one millimeter or smaller, but if we're doing a chest, abdomen, and pelvis, due to the amount of a ground that we actually have to cover, it's essential that we use thicker slices so that we can acquire the images at a rap more rapid fashion. Uh, and 2.5s are still going to be adequate to recon in threes, so uh, we're wanting to recon in three to fives. Uh, typically for a chest, you might recon in threes, but for a chest, abdomen, pelvis, typically you're going to look for fives. Uh, so somewhere in this vicinity between three and five is where you're going to usually land. Uh, pitch is usually going to be around four to six. And for high speed, once again, it's going to be six to one. And so typically if you're just doing chest, uh, you're going to be scanning from the apices or the superior margins of the clavicles all the way down to the adrenal glands. Um, but notice that this protocol allows you to scan further down uh, if you see that the disease extends into that abdominal aorta. And so if you were to see something here, then it would be essential to even continue scanning down to there so that you actually get the aorta as best that you can. Uh, we're also looking for IV contrast. Uh, you're looking for LOCMs at 3 to 4 milliliters per second. And you're typically going to use bolus tracking software. And bolus tracking software is going to be placed somewhere inside the aorta. Uh, some people favor putting it in the aortic arch, which is here. Uh, some people favor putting it in uh, the aorta, the descending aorta, somewhere here. Uh, wherever you would like to put it um, will be usually sufficient uh, because either way, you're as long as you're in the aorta, uh, you're going to get uh, an excellent so, uh, you're, you're going to get an excellent flush. Uh, the bolus tracking software is usually going to make the scan go around 17 to 20 seconds, but don't be shocked if it goes a little longer uh, if, on the average of 25. Uh, this is one of those things that can be really uh, skewed by the patient's cardiac situation. Um, if the patient is having severe cardiac abnormalities, um, they got a high BNP, things like that, and you know the heart's not really functioning very well, uh, then typically it's going to take you're going to see pooling of fluid in the, uh, in the left ventricle. And so the left ventricle, especially if there's any damage to the left ventricle, it's not going to be able to exert all of this out into the aorta. And so sometimes you'll, you'll have a lag in contrast. So don't be shocked if it goes over that. Uh, 
this says that 150 milliliters is going to be delivered. Um, typically, uh, 100 milliliters will usually suffice um, because uh, the one thing uh, that I really um, kind of uh, dislike about this book uh, that I got some of these protocols from is that at 150 if this person does have any damage we've delivered 150 uh, and they have to go to the cath lab uh, for immediate uh, interventional uh, examinations uh, then there's going to be additional contrast used and so I think it's essential that we use as little contrast as we can uh, not from a money saving aspect or anything like that but simply so that we uh, decrease the risk of adverse effects for the patient in case something else does need to go on. Um, also, uh, initial non-contrast scans at three levels, uh, the aortic arch, mid-ascending aorta, and distal descending aorta, should be obtained to potentially identify patients with acute intramural hematomas and or displaced intimal calcifications. And so basically you want to cover all of these things, uh, the aortic arch, mid-ascending aorta, and distal descending aorta. So you want to cover all of those. Uh, Multiplanar reformatted images are very helpful to assist display of intimal flat and the true and false aluminum. And so we saw that um, if you have an aortic dissection, you'll see something like this running through your image. And this will be the intimal flat. And so uh, it might look like this on the axial, but on your sagittal, you may see something like this, or the chromal, you may see something like that. So it's very essential uh, to really diagnose it using uh, multiplanar reconstructions. And then three dimensional reconstructions aid pre surgical planning for aortic aneurysm repair, are particularly useful in delineating the relationship of the aneurysm to the branch vessels. So uh, the NPRs can really be. NPRs plus volume renderings uh, can be very essential in the diagnostic process for aortic abnormalities. So they, that's why they are essential. Okay. Um, central airway disease or hyalur evaluation. Uh, this is for central endotracheal or endobronchial mass airway patency. A stenosis dissonance in higher mass. Or we're looking for a KDB being around 140 and MA being 120 for typical settings uh, for your chest. Oral contrast, we're not going to have any. Um, inspiration is going to be when we're going to have the patient suspend. And we're going to require these at around 1 to 2.5 millimeter, 2.5 being the maximum that you want to require that which allows us to film it at uh, 5 or you can go even lower than that and go to 2.5 um, to demonstrate some type of anatomy um, better than others. I'm going to look at 4 to 6 and a high speed uh, pitch of 6 to 1. We're looking at the typical positioning for the chest from the uh, superior portion of the chest or the apices. Uh, down to the diaphragm or the adrenal glands. Uh, and if uh, contrast medium is used, it's going to be LOCM and it's going to be three millimeters or milliliters per second. And we're going to delay 20 seconds after the initial start of the injection. And we're only going to use around 100 milliliters uh, to better demonstrate each of these. So that brings us to small airways disease, which is uh, much the same as the reason why we need high or high resolution uh, CT. Uh, we're looking for things such as bronchiectasis, uh, inflammatory diseases, bronchiolitis, 
mosaic ventilation, and even air trapping. Uh, settings for the scanner are going to be much the same as we have seen throughout. Uh, KV is going to be 140, MA is going to be 120, no oral contrast. Uh, we're going to initially scan at inspiration, but if necessary, uh, scans can be acquired at expiration. Thickness is going to be 1 to 1.25, so there is a shift. We want the smallest uh, slices available. So that's typically what we're looking for. Uh, reconstruction slice thickness interval for filming. Uh, we're going to continue whatever we pretty much recon, whatever we acquired them at, that's what we're going to recon them in. Um, pitch is going to be virtually the same, 4 to 6. And high speed is going to be 6 to 1. Uh, we're still going from the lung apices to the adrenal glands. And there's going to be no IV contrast. So uh, what this book really tells you is that uh, what they're looking at is a, a GE light speed scanner. That, that's what they're utilizing. And they say that an average 20 centimeter chest can be imaged in 26 seconds of breath holding. Uh, if this can't be sustained, it's probably best to switch to axial mode with one millimeter collimation obtained at 10 millimeter intervals. So basically, you're going to have uh, one millimeter slices at 10 millimeters away uh, from each other. Uh, additional images may also be obtained in expiration uh, to detect air trapping present. This technique should be performed in cases in which a mosaic attenuation pattern of one parenchymal density is identified to differentiate airway disease from mosaic perfusion due to primary vascular disease or alveolitis. And so basically, um, sometimes this will be indicated uh, that you do an expiration scan uh, to just differentiate between inspiration and expiration. Uh, but typically, you're going to look for inspiration scans. And uh, if, this is, uh, if this is required, uh, then it will be made a note of and, uh, by a physician that they want an expiration scan as well as an inspiration scan. Okay, so hemoptosis, which is occult airway disease. This is going to be a very interesting type of skin. Uh, basically, what you're looking for is occult airway disease. KV is going to be lower. It's going to be 120, and your MA is going to be 140. Once again, no oral contrast. Phase of respiration, once again, is going to be inspiration, so the patient will be scanned on inspiration. You're going to acquire slices at 1 millimeter to 2.5 millimeters. And so uh, where we're scanning is actually going to decide what type of uh, slice thickness we're going to have on film. So the important thing to notice is that there are three phases. There's phase one, phase two, and phase three. And so basically, what we're doing here is phase one, pretty much whatever you scanned in, that's what you're going to recon in. Uh, phase two, you're going to actually modify it to do uh, 2.5 to 3. And then phase three, you're going to go back to whatever you acquire your slices in. Uh, pitch is going to be the same as what we've all already been talking about. Uh, the interesting thing is going to be the scanning area. So that's something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, phase one is going to be the superior margins of the clavicle, just two centimeters above the carina. So let's identify our structures. Here's the carina, and so we're going to assume that this is around two centimeters above. Uh, it could be a little too low, but here is 
superior margins of the clavicle. And so here is the lung apices. So we scan from basically a little bit above the lung apices to two centimeters above the coronary. So then we go to phase two. So phase two. We go from the two centimeters above the corona to the inferior pulmonary veins. And so that's going to be kind of hard to really differentiate where uh, the pulmonary veins are going to be. Uh, but we have to know a few basic things about anatomy. Uh, the pulmonary arteries usually lie at the corona. Uh, that's typically where you're going to look for. And so your pulmonary veins are going to be below the pulmonary arteries. Uh, so we are looking at uh, one vertebral level, two vertebral levels, almost two and a half vertebral levels, assuredly getting us uh, where the inferior pulmonary veins are on most patients. And then uh, we go from the inferior pulmonary veins to the adrenal glands on phase three. So um, Typically, if, if we notice where we're actually scanning through on this, uh, the smaller slices are going to indicate where we want higher resolution. So we want greater resolution here, and we want greater resolution here. So one and three are going to be the scans that have, or the phases that have the greatest resolution in terms of CT. And so uh, we're going to use LOCM. Uh, whatever type that your facility has. Uh, we typically use Isoview, uh, but there are, are many different other types of contrast that classify as LOC uh, at three milliliters per second. So we're going to go around three milliliters per second, which is still capable with a 22 gauge ID. And so at 20 seconds after the initial contrast that's typically what we're going to shoot for in terms of uh, scanning the patient and then um, we're going to deliver around 100 milliliters uh, of fluid so basically at the time of the scan we're going to have injected 60 milliliters uh, another thing that I, I would like to say is that uh, this total volume delivered can be uh, altered. Um, uh, I know this is coming kind of late in this series of images and things that we've been talking about, but uh, if you have a bolus of uh, saline trailing behind your initial contrast injection then usually that you can get away with using lower amounts of contrast simply because of um, the bolus pushing the contrast farther. And so it's always a good idea to use a bolus of saline which will affect uh, your total volume delivered and hopefully lower it down. Uh, also, uh, we can use a 22 gauge IV, but we typically want to use a 20 or an 18 gauge uh, to be on the safe side for each and every patient. Okay, so focal lung disease. So uh, we already saw that we're looking for a nodule and uh, what a nodule protocol was and how it was just basically almost mirroring a routine chest, however, without any contrast. And we'll see that this, this focal lung disease scan is much different than that. But the reason we're looking for it is that the patient has a solitary pulmonary nodule or an arto arteriovenous malformation. And so basically, we've already saw that the patient does have a nodule, and now we're wanting to see what it actually looks like and, and how it performs with the injection of contrast. So there are a few steps that we have to take. Number one, scanner has to be set to 120, and MA being 240. 
no world contrast. Uh, it's going to still be at inspiration. And we're going to have three phases. I know that phases necessarily aren't. Um, phase three is not labeled here, but right in that phase three mirrors phase two. So I uh, pretty much however you recon your images uh, for phase two, that's how phase three is going to be as well. Uh, phase one is basically your initial planning stage. <sighs> your images are going to be acquired at one to five millimeters, and you're going to pretty much scan a long portion. Phase two, on the other hand, is going to be scanned at one to one point two five. And phase three is going to have the same scan setup. Another interesting thing is the reconstruction interval for filming. Uh, phase one is going to be seven to seven and a half, meaning that you really don't have great resolution on this and you have a tendency to lose things. Uh, phase two, on the other hand, is going to be one, one point two five. And phase three. Is going to be one to one point two five as well, because what you're going to notice is that phase two and phase three are going to be virtually the same scans. Only the only difference is that phase two does not have contrast. Phase three does. Uh, the pitch is going to be once again four to six, uh, with high speed being six to one. So the interesting thing is going to be our scanning area. Uh, you're going to be from above the apices to the adrenal glands for phase one. So this is phase one here. So somewhere in phase one, you're going to have seen a nodule. So here is the nodule. And so we decided we want a little better differentiation about this nodule. So instead of scanning the entire chest and, and increasing the dosage of the patient a great deal, we negate uh, scanning through the upper portions of the chest. The only thing that we need to do is get an, uh, a superior and inferior portion above and below the nodule. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're scanning into this little area here. And this is without contrast and so there's no contrast on phase two phase three on the other hand actually does yield contrast and notice it's virtually identical scan uh, you have margins above and below the nodule but you do have injection of the contrast medium which will highlight the vessel or not highlight the vessel and so that's what phase three is primarily concerned with uh, so keep this in mind, the IV contrast, none in phase one and two, but there is in phase three. And it's going to be at two to three milliliters per second. Uh, and you're going to have an interesting protocol here. So phase three is going to be conducted at one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and four minutes after contrast has been injected. So what you're wanting to do is see how well this contrast uh, actually enhances or doesn't do anything to this nodule. And so uh, that's going to be the reasoning behind this. And you're going to look for 100 milliliters uh, at most of contrast medium injected. Uh, hopefully we favor on the smaller side here. But you're looking to see how well this nodule either enhances or unenhances. Okay, uh, trauma survey. Okay. So uh, basically, this is used for a patient who has penetrating or blunt trauma. Uh, your scanner settings are going to be 140 
and EMA is going to be 120. Once again, no oral contrast. And this is going to be a difficult thing for the patient to have. If they have blunt penetrating trauma, it's going to be very difficult for them to suspend inspiration. Uh, so many times you're just going to have to uh, do everything that you can to make the scan go quicker. Uh, and uh, that's really what our pitch will come in handy for. And your slice acquisition is going to be 1 to 2.5. We favor being on the smaller side simply so that we can, if we want uh, to recon or we need to see minor details, we can always go back to these acquisition slices. Uh, but for the most part, your filming is going to be at 5 millimeter uh, so that you can uh, have still pretty good detail, but very uh, pretty much if you go from 2.5 to 5, you decrease your images by half. And so it's, it's increasing the amount of images that can be looked at at a very rapid rate. Uh, but also, uh, your pitch is going to play a very important role here. Notice that it says variable. Uh, basically, so what you're wanting to do is to include thorax in a single breath hold. And so, uh, notice high speed is 6 to 1. Typically, that's what you're going to want for contract, uh, for a trauma, simply because you don't have a great deal of time to waste around um, trying to rescan and rescan the images. You need to get it right pretty quick. And so, to do that, you may have to bump your pitch up. Uh, once again, the studies have demonstrated that an increased pitch is really not as big of a detriment as one's thought uh, in regards to CT. And so uh, what you're going to look for is the superior margins of the clavicle or the apices down to the adrenals. Uh, many times you'll, you may want to even scan a little lower um, if, if asked to. Uh, not always are you going to be injecting IV contrast. Uh, sometimes protocols uh, say that you should, but there's a lot of times that protocols don't necessarily say that you should inject contrast either. Uh, so uh, IV contrast, if ordered, is going to be at 2 milliliters per second. And you're going to inject 45 seconds, or you're going to scan 45 seconds after the initial injection. Um, this is going to yield about 100 to 125 milliliters of total volume of contrast. However, once again, pushing a bolus, saline, will drastically reduce the amount of contrast that, is need, that needs to be uh, used to provide a, a very excellent study. So that's something to consider. Uh, we all have, most, most facilities have power injectors that are dual stage. And that really helps being able to push a bolus of saline uh, to enhance the patient uh, to a further degree. But the name of the game uh, for your trauma patient is to get the patient in and out of the CT suite as quick as possible while yielding diagnostic uh, images that are adequate uh, to benefit the patient. That is what our main goal is, and um, it's essential that we get them in and out very rapidly. Okay, so that brings us to a lung cancer screening. Okay, so lung cancer screenings are basically used for detection of radiographically occult nodules uh, in an individual high risk for lung cancer. Remember that we said that lung cancer screenings typically are not, um, they're thought of in one of two ways. They're either uh, highly regarded or they're loathed uh, and typically uh, we're seeing that a lot of a lot of people are beginning to say that maybe they're not as useful as what we initially thought and this is because of once again your lung nodule having to be seven to nine millimeters in size to actually yield some beneficial reading here and once again we really cannot diagnose whether it's malignant or benign. We simply have to go on that there is a nodule and then there's further testing that has to be done. 
And so uh, lung cancer screenings have kind of fallen out of favor. Um, but who knows what the future holds for this, if we can actually increase the amount of uh, diagnostic quality here, then there is potential use for it. Uh, scanner settings is going to be KV at 140, MA is going to be 20 to 40. I uh, notice that your MA is going to be really low, so hopefully this is going to be a low dose. Uh, oral contrast, none. Scan is going to be conducted at inspiration. And our acquisition slice thickness is going to be around 1 to 2.5 millimeters. Um, so hopefully that you don't actually miss a nodule. But the key thing here is that we can recon at 5 to 7 millimeters. Uh, 7 would probably be, um, I, I really doubt that 7 would be something that you'd want to recon these images at. So let's say 7 goes away and let's say that you could scan at you could recon it three millimeter too. Um, but seven is kind of one of those things that you're almost to the point of why even perform the scan because if we refer back here that um, seven to nine millimeters a nodule has to be to actually be pretty much demonstrated on CT, then seven millimeter slices won't get the job done. Uh, pitch, it's going to be variable, but uh, typically you're wanting to go somewhere around the high speed because if you're wanting low dosage, then high speed is also going to be able to add as well. And so, uh, where you're going to scan is much just like all our typical chests, you're going to scan from the top of the lungs down to the adrenal glands. So apices to adrenals um, or to the diaphragms, uh, either way is sufficient, um, but you definitely want to be able to get all of the lungs because you don't want to miss any nodule. Uh, you don't want to miss a nodule here uh, because you stopped here. And so it's essential that you continue scanning and not only uh, sometimes your AP really doesn't give you a, a good demonstration because uh, we would think that diaphragm is ended here, but notice that there's still portions of the lung that are residing lower here. Uh, also notice that there is no contrast utilized here. So uh, pretty much this should be a very quick in and out procedure. Uh, and once again, it's low dosage. Um, that's one of the things that kind of drives it. Uh, still and keeps it kind of compelled into the prominence that it is, is that it's low dosage and so hypothetically the patient is uh, receiving such a low dose that uh, we're really not increasing the likelihood of, any, uh, of there being something go wrong with this scan. Uh, but once again, uh, based on the, the poor results that we've saw uh, from two independent studies uh, kind of leaves lung cancer screenings in doubt.